10, 9, ignition sequence start. 5, 4, we have ignition. All engines are running. We have liftoff. From imagination to reality. The story of the British Interplanetary Society. Part 1. Origins. I knelt and then seated myself at the edge of the manhole, peering over it. Beneath, within a yard of my face, lay the untrodden soil of the moon. There came a little pause. Our eyes met. It doesn't distress your lungs too much, said Cavour. No, I said, I can stand this. He sat down on the edge of the manhole. He let his feet drop until they were within six inches of the lunar ground. He hesitated for a moment, then thrust himself forward, dropped these intervening inches, and stood upon the untrodden soil of the moon. As the 19th century turned into the 20th, travelling in space and exploring the surface of the moon and the other planets remained the province of fantasists, like H.G. Wells in his book, First Men in the Moon. Throughout history, writers had speculated on methods of escaping from the Earth and exploring the heavens. But it was only towards the end of the 1800s that writers like Jules Verne and H.G. Wells began to try to address the problem seriously. Doug Millard is head curator of space at the London Science Museum. Let's just look at what Jules Verne wrote in the mid-19th century. He wrote a, a fascinating book, De la Terre à la Lune. It looked at how people might be transported to, to the moon. Now, he didn't use a rocket. He actually used a ballistic shell, a, a huge cannon. So he got it wrong there because the acceleration, when this large people-carrying shell was fired from its cannon, would have killed the occupants immediately. He didn't take into account the aerodynamic heating as the shell passed through the atmosphere. Latterly, H.G. Wells also turned his hand to uh, what we call science fiction, particularly interesting because he was uh, investigating a new type of physics, uh, Cavorite, which would enable people to shield themselves from Earth's gravity and thereby ascend to the moon. All these types of story, particularly Wells and Verne, but others as well, they had a direct bearing, an influence on the engineers, on the technologists who went on to pioneer the space programme. But even while H.G. Wells's fictional account of the first lunar expedition was being published, others were attempting to look at more realistic methods of escaping Earth's gravity and exploring space. Foremost amongst these was a deaf Russian schoolteacher named Konstantin Silkovsky. From the 1890s onwards, Tsiolkovsky published works detailing practical methods of using rocket vehicles to explore space. Doug Millard again. Tsiolkovsky, he's looked upon quite understandably as the grandfather of astronautics and principally the science of astronautics. He looked at the theory of how space travel could be affected and also how humans could... Uh, reach and move through space. But he suffered for his beliefs in the turbulent years of the early Soviet Union, so his reputation rather ebbed and flowed, certainly internally. Eventually, he was recognised for what he did, and that was to put down on paper some very serious thinking about the theory of space flight. While the theory of space flight was established by Silkovsky in Russia... The work of developing a practical, liquid fueled rocket was undertaken on the other side of the world by an American engineer named Robert Hutchings Goddard. Whereas Silkovsky was primarily a theoretician, Robert Goddard, who was a fully trained scientist and engineer, he also experimented. His reputation is built on the success of his experimental programme. 
And indeed, it was Robert Goddard who launched the world's first liquid-propelled rockets in 1926. Goddard was arguably the greatest rocket experimenter of the 20th century. When you look at what he achieved with his very small team, there are few who come close to having achieved what Goddard did. During this time, the rocket began to take a hold on the imagination of the public around the world. When we look at the 1920s and uh, early 1930s, there's quite clearly this coalescing of international interest in spaceflight and rocketry. As we move through the 20th century, we have other media coming into the public sphere. If we stick with publishing, we have what Arthur Clarke refers to as the pulp comics, the wonderful stories, astounding stories that were coming over the Atlantic from the United States. There was this genre of science fiction which was um, gathering a momentum. Of course, there was the movie industry. There was this new way of conveying visual imagery to large numbers of people. This certainly had an effect in Germany where the relationship between what we might call the rocket fad in the late 20s and early 1930s was uh, intimately geared to the film industry with uh, Fritz Lang, Frau im Mond. There was this gradual building up of momentum. Internationally, there was this groundswell of interest in rocketry. In the 1920s, that fascination with rocket technology manifested itself in the establishment of a number of rocket societies. In Russia, the Society for the Study of Interplanetary Communications was established, while in America there was the American Interplanetary Society, later to rename itself the American Rocket Society. There were even some small rocket societies experimenting with solid propellants in the United Kingdom. But by far the most successful of all the pre-war rocket societies was the Verein für Raumschifffahrt, or VFR, in Germany. The VFR was formed in 1927, and a number of its members were to become the most influential figures in the history of rocketry, and ultimately space flight. The VFR, the Verein für Raumschifffahrt, was the, the German uh, society that was formed by a relatively small group of amateurs who were interested in theorising and then experimenting with rocketry in order to try and reach space, simple as that. Some people point to the Treaty of Versailles which was um, signed at the end of World War I, which put restrictions on what the German armed forces could develop in the way of long-range weaponry. The German army set out to investigate the work of the uh, German rocket society to see what it could learn. The army was a little bit sniffy about what the VFR was doing, and decided that it was far too lax in its science and its parameters. But what this interest did reveal were the talents of people like Werner von Braun, and of course it was von Braun who went on with some others to work with and for the army in developing long-range missiles. It was against this background that in 1933 a young engineer named Philip Cleeter established the British Interplanetary Society in Liverpool. Like so many others, as a young man, Cleeter had become fascinated with the rocket and its potential for exploring space. An article written by him about the possibilities of space flight for the Liverpool Echo was seen by journalist N. E. Moore Raymond, who subsequently published an article in the Daily Express describing Cleeter's ambition to establish a society for those interested in space exploration. In fact, Moore Raymond was so enthusiastic about the project that he became the society's inaugural member. The Daily Express article was successful in attracting a number of space enthusiasts. 
And following an informal meeting at Cleta's home, the inaugural meeting of the British Interplanetary Society was held in the offices of H.C. Binns Solicitors in Dale Street, Liverpool, on the 13th of October 1933. Cleta was duly elected the Society's first president. The membership fee for ordinary members was set at ten shillings and sixpence and it was resolved to publicise the Society's aims and objectives in a publication to be called The Journal of the British Interplanetary Society. One of the first priorities for the fledgling society was to increase its membership. And to this end, Cleta continued to write magazine articles, exploring the possibilities of the exploration of space and describing the work of the BIS. An article by Cleta that appeared in the science fiction magazine Scoops had a profound effect on the life of one young space enthusiast. I am Leslie Robert Shepherd, and I have been a member of the BIS since 1935. I became interested in space through reading the a science fiction story in the boys magazine. The story was called The Mighty Monster of Mars. That was what started me off. I came to hear about the BIS in 1934. There was published in this country what amounted to a newspaper of science fiction stories it was called Scoops, and it was in that that I uh, read about the British Interplanetary Society, which had just been formed a year earlier. I immediately applied, and in the March journal, my name appeared amongst the list of new members. But I played no active part in the BIS before the war, in fact, being in South Wales for the first 18 years of my life, I was remote from any activity. When I moved up to London, because I became a student at uh, University College, I attended just one meeting in the Mason's Arms in Maddox Street. During the time that I was active in the BIS, I was president in seven years. I was also given a rather fancy title in '47 of technical director. This had no really serious meaning in terms of direction. It simply meant that we had a number of technical groups and we, they used to hold meetings occasionally and uh, I coordinated that. Despite the enthusiasm of the small group of BIS members, Les Shepard was under no illusions about the public's view of their dream of space flight. We were crackpots before the war. A whole lot of nonsense. In fact, the scientific establishment was busy showing that interplanetary flight was impossible because none of the possible fuels or propellants had enough energy to get into orbit. They didn't embrace the step principle or anything like that. They were so wrong. The name interplanetary was, to some of its members, contentious. At a time when the concept of space travel was still regarded as the wildest fantasy, many thought that the society would have more credibility if, like its counterpart in America, it substituted the word rocket. Les Shepard believes history has vindicated the decision to remain an interplanetary society. There was a strong feeling that it was more respectable to be a rocket society. Fortunately, that was resisted. And so we entered the post-war period still as the British Interplanetary Society. And an interesting thing was that at one stage, a quarter of our members were Americans who were disgruntled with the American Rocket Society and still wanted to insist on the astronautical aspect. 
Even after the war, there was strong pressure in the society to change, become respectable and become a rocket society. In this business, you shouldn't be respectable. You should go on with what you believed in, because sooner or later you'll be proved right. By 1936, the BIS membership was still small, but boasted a London branch led by Professor Archibald Lowe, the first legitimate scientist to join the group. Amongst the London membership were Arthur C. Clarke, Ralph Smith, J. H. Edwards, J. G. Strong and E. J. Carnell, all of whom were to be influential in the Society's early history. From the start, though, the relationship between the Liverpool and London branches was a difficult one and rapidly came under increasing strain. The uh, BIS was brought into being by Phil Cleeter, and he had uh, a small group that he worked with. But it really boiled down to the fact that he ran it autocratically himself, and some dissent arose from that. Now, in uh, 1936, the centre of gravity of the membership had moved south, a London uh, group was set up under uh, A.M. Lowe. They really were more capable of running the society. And bearing in mind that there was this dissension and dissatisfaction with the fact that Cleta was a little bit autocratic and did all of the work himself, considerably he was a very active person, it was decided that they would pack it in in Liverpool and the whole thing would be transferred to London. So from 1936, 37 onwards, the meetings were held in London. With the divisive Liverpool-London dispute behind them, the Society, under the chairmanship of A.M. Lowe, undertook the first of what would be a number of pioneering theoretical studies. In 1936, the BIS Technical Committee, under the chairmanship of J.H. Edwards, began a project looking into the practicalities of mounting an expedition to the moon. Robert Parkinson joined the BIS in 1956 and produced a book called High Road to the Moon, detailing the Society's lunar project. Prior to World War II, there was a group in the BIS, all based in London, who were very enthusiastic and, being pioneers, thought about what it would take to send a man to the moon. People involved in that, people like Arthur Clarke, R.A. Smith, Harry Ross and various people who were very enthusiastic and fairly well-educated amateurs. While the BIS lunar project of the 1930s was a serious attempt to look at the problems of space exploration, the pioneers were hampered by the sheer lack of data available to them about the practicalities of rocketry. At the time, before the war, they weren't entirely sure about what you could do with liquid propellant rockets. The BIS moonship of 1939, looking back, is not realistic. And a, a good example is that the, the, the manned capsule that sits on the top of this moonship is reckoned to be about a tonne in weight and carry three astronauts and it's very easy to start adding things that go into that and realise that there's no way you're going to put the weight of three people plus life support plus a shell around the outside plus some oxygen for them to breathe and sandwiches to take along the way in one ton it just doesn't add up but I suspect that they were deliberately a little bit vague because they didn't actually know about performance of almost everything and it was a very brave effort because really it was the first time anybody had attempted to put a consistent system together. While launching liquid fueled rockets in the UK would have been fraught with difficulty, the members of the study group did build one piece of hardware. The Curlier stat was intended to allow a steady view of the universe out of a rotating spacecraft. <laughs> 
They didn't know whether people could live in zero gravity, so they expected to spin their spacecraft to give them artificial gravity all the way to the moon, which meant that the stars went by outside. Somebody actually built a model of a curliostat to demonstrate that you could sort of see the stars statically when you were actually rotating. And I believe that it was used in public demonstrations. Throughout the 1930s, the BIS continued its activities against the ever-looming threat of war. In Germany, the VFR had ceased to exist in 1933, when many of its members had been absorbed into the military rocket programme. The rapid progress being made in Germany under government patronage was in stark contrast to the almost purely theoretical work being done in Britain, and even to the modest progress being made in the birthplace of the liquid rocket, America. Robert Goddard was a brilliant engineer, whose achievements are all the more impressive when one considers the modest resources he was working with. One drawback for the American pioneer was his reticence to publicise himself or his work. By contrast, the charismatic young Werner von Braun, who was now in charge of the German rocket programme, was an accomplished communicator who could sell the rocket initially to the German military and in later years to the American public. Doug Millard again. Unfortunately, Robert Goddard had bad experiences with the media, as we would call them today. He responded badly to some headlines following some of his experiments. After the rocket quits our air and really starts on its longer journey, it will neither be accelerated nor maintained by the explosion of the charges it then might have left. To claim that it would be is to deny a fundamental law of dynamics. Professor Goddard does not know of the relationship of action to reaction and the need to have something better than a vacuum against which to react. He only seems to lack the knowledge ladled out daily in high schools. The New York Times Moon rocket misses target by 238,799 and one-half miles. The Worcester Evening Post The consequence was that he withdrew himself. He drew his experimental programme, his small team, in on themselves. And if we are, with the benefit of hindsight, to make comparisons between what went on in America and, for example, what went on in uh, pre-war Germany, where there was a symbiotic relationship between the German army and its rocket programme, its missile programme, and the amateur experimenters, Goddard never affected that relationship with the the US military. And of course, if we um, think of von Braun as one example of the German um, experimenters, he was well aware, he knew absolutely that in order to realise his dreams of space flight, he had to work with the military. He was quite clear about that. And a lot of his activities were geared to enabling that symbiosis to come together. And the same applied uh, later on when he was working on the American space program. He was a very canny political animal and he knew what levers to pull. Goddard doesn't appear to have had that knowledge or possibly he just wasn't interested. While von Braun and many of the other members of the now defunct VFR had chosen to continue their development programme under the patronage of the military, there were a number of German rocket pioneers who chose not to involve themselves in developing Hitler's long-range weapon and in doing so put themselves at serious risk. Philip Kleter had established links with the other European rocket societies in the early 30s and was instrumental in assisting the German rocket pioneer, Willy Ley, to escape from the increasingly oppressive Nazi regime to America. In 1939, the activities of the British Interplanetary Society were suspended following the outbreak of World War II. But as the members of the society said their farewells to go to an uncertain future, Few, if any, could have conceived that the war itself would fundamentally change the whole field of rocketry and open up the region beyond the Earth's atmosphere. If we look at 
uh, the role of the Second World War in the story of space flight. And you can't do the last without considering World War Two. One might focus on uh, what we call the V-2 missile, what was uh, then called the, the aggregate for A-4 long-range missile. I work in the Science Museum in London and we have a V-2 missile on display in one of the galleries. It was clearly a very large beast and that's the point when one's looking at the history of space flight. Although people were aware of the potential of rockets to facilitate space flight, it was only when the quantum leap of technology with building the A4, far, far bigger than anything that had been built before, uh, was demonstrated that people realised that the space frontier was now really very close indeed and it would be breached in, in a matter of years. So it was the, the technology of the A4 which demonstrated that the, um, the space flight really could be done. The other thing that we need to think about with the uh, relationship between World War II and the um, ensuing space flight revolution, we might call it, big science is a term that's often used to describe this sort of working. Uh, in other words, uh, large groups of people, scientists, engineers, technologists and the military, of course, working together to affect a major outcome. Now, the V2 programme in Germany, that, that actually cost more money than the Manhattan Project uh, for the building of the first atomic bomb in the United States. But the point is they are of similar magnitudes, of commitment of resources. So what World War II demonstrated specifically was what could be achieved with this sort of scale of commitment for rocketry. Part 2. The post-war period. On the 13th of June, 1945, A.M. Lowe convened a meeting to begin the process of reforming the BIS. The proposal was to merge the BIS with the combined British Astronautical Societies, a body which had been formed from a number of smaller pre-war societies. But, as Les Shepard explains, the group which finally emerged left two of the pre-war pioneers marginalised. At the end of the war, old BIS members were circulated by a note which said that uh, there would be a meeting and uh, A.M. Lowe, who was the BIS president immediately before the war, in London, but that meeting was held and I was one of about nine or ten people attending it. And we formed an interim committee. One of the people there was Len Carter, who was to play such an important role in the BIS. He uh, offered to uh, write articles with a view to the society becoming a legal entity. And he set out to do that. But in a way, this meeting was gazumped. There was another society, the CBAS, the Combined British Astronautical Societies, and they set up another meeting in September of 1945. I wasn't present at that meeting, but at that meeting, which was held by Eric Burgess, their intention was to take over the mainstream of British society interest in astronautics. They succeeded in a way in, in uh, really ruling out all that had happened in uh, the previous meeting in London. And in the course of it, they got rid of A.M. Lowe, rather reprehensibly, I thought. And in effect, although they didn't get rid of him, they sidetracked later. They formed an interim committee and then there was a proper assembled council in October, of which I was a member. New plans for the BIS were set up. In fact, they thought of a different name, but Len Carter had got so far in registering the name of the BIS 
and the BIS was known internationally, so they decided to go on calling it the BIS. So in January 1946, the new BIS came into being. The newly reformed British Interplanetary Society quickly resumed its study of the problem of sending expeditions to the Moon. But it did so on a completely different basis from its theoretical pre-war studies. There was now no doubt that very large liquid-fuelled rockets were feasible. They had crashed onto British cities in the form of the notorious V-2 missile. And even during the war, German scientists had been planning even larger stepped rockets capable of crossing the Atlantic Ocean to America. Robert Parkinson again. After the war, a whole lot of things had changed. Everybody knew about the V2. Everybody knew that von Braun and the Germans had made a successfully large liquid propellant rocket. They almost instantly had access to weights and performance and so forth. By 1946, these enthusiastic core of the BIS, uh, in particular uh, R.A. Smith and I think Harry Ross, had put together a scheme that they called Mega Rock, which was to upgrade a V2 and take a man up to a million feet in altitude as a sort of super sounding rocket which went down like a lead balloon, uh, but in effect was realistic. If money had been no object, perhaps, then basically the sums were right. The thing could have been produced something like that. And that little group in particular around R.A. Smith and Harry Ross continued to look at the conquest of space. During the BIS Lunar Project... R.A. Smith, an accomplished artist, created dozens of drawings of the project. It was these which Robert Parkinson used to illustrate the book High Road to the Moon, a publication which played an influential part in the Society's history. R.A. Smith, he was a draftsman at Westcott at that point, but he'd been a professional illustrator and so forth before the war. Out of that particular set of exercises, Arthur Clarke and R.A. Smith put together a book called The Exploration of the Moon, which was a kind of systematic view of the future, going from first rockets all the way through to a colonised moon. When R.A. Smith died, all the pictures and so forth had become BIS property. Len Carter, who was the executive secretary of the BIS, asked me whether we could actually assemble these into a book and how we would do it and and so forth. And we got the idea that you might actually look at the comparison between how things had actually happened and how they'd originally thought they were going to happen. Much to my surprise, the thing was actually very successful. The title got dreamt up with a little group of us at Westcott who used to go out drinking at lunchtime together with the subtitle From Imagination to Reality, which then became the motto of the BIS. So that was quite nice. That eventually became something of significance. During the post-war period, the BIS had consolidated its position as one of the world's leading astronautical bodies. The pre-war collection of amateur enthusiasts was rapidly becoming a professional organisation. Many of its members were directly employed by the space industry. Ralph Smith, who became BIS president in 1956, was a draftsman at the Rocket Development Centre at Westcott in Buckinghamshire. Another highly influential member, Val Cleaver, became head of the rocket engine division of Rolls-Royce. Les Shepard recalls those years during which the society went from being an anonymous collection of space pioneers to an internationally recognised body, and about the contribution of one particular individual. In the early days, the venues for meetings were many and varied. Well, up until the move to London, of course, they were just more or less held in Cleta's house or in some little office in Liverpool. But when it moved to London, they didn't have a regular venue, but the words Mason's Arms and Maddox Street come to mind. These were the places where the meetings were held. But 
They used to also mean to get get together in people's rooms and so on, because in setting up this lunar project, there were about oh nine or ten people involved, and they used to meet. And one of the meeting places would have been Arthur Clarke's digs. The society flourished largely due to the efforts of Len Carter, and initially its official address was his address. The first genuine headquarters that the society had was in Bespre Gardens, and Len was partly employed on a real uh, paying basis, though he wasn't paid very much, and he still retained his work in uh, accountancy. He became, from then on, in effect, the executive secretary of the society. And then it flourished. We never looked back after that. Across the world, many of the pre-war astronautical societies had re-established themselves. The BIS was instrumental in bringing these groups together for what was to become an annual congress of astronautical groups and in establishing the International Astronautical Federation. The situation was that by 1949 there were something like six or seven societies dotted around Europe and uh, the ARS in America with whom we were also in contact and the Pacific Rocket Society. The first suggestion came from the new German Gesellschaft für Weltraumforschung, GFW, in Stuttgart. They decided we should have a meeting to arrange international liaison. They addressed this proposal to the BIS because the BIS by this time was quite a large society. I had over a thousand members and none of these other societies had more than about 50 odd. They addressed it to the BIS, suggesting the BIS should hold such a meeting. The BIS, being a bit conservative, went along with this fully but said, well, we need two years to plan this. And that's how it stood, briefly. But then Ananoff, he had this little subcommittee of the Aeronautical Society, which he called the Group of Mon Astronautique Francais. And he said, well, I can hold a meeting in Paris in the interim. So we all jumped at that idea and hiked over to uh, Paris in September uh, 1950. And there we planned the International Astronautical Federation. We didn't set it up there and then, but it was arranged that the London meeting, which was still on the cards, would be held next year, and that we would found the federation then. And that in the meantime, the BIS would collect and collate all the proposals. We didn't get many proposals to collate. They came mainly from the Germans and ourselves. But we held that meeting in September 1950 and founded the International Astronautical Federation. And Eugen Zenger, who'd been made chairman of an interim committee which we'd formed up in Paris, he was there. He was made the first president of the IAF. We called it the Second International Astronautical Congress because Adenoff had called his the First International Astronautical Congress, so we agreed to keep that name. The London Congress was more a pattern from, for the subsequent ones because we arranged a four-session symposium for which, which I was responsible for organising. I took the liberty of giving the, the opening address and chairing the first meeting. It had four sessions. And amongst other contributions, we got a written one from Werner von Braun, which was read from, for him by Frederick Durant from the American Rocket Society. And uh, the IAF never looked back after that. The following meeting was at Stuttgart, I came away from the Stuttgart meeting as the vice president and because of that I'm the longest surviving officer 
of the Federation. The concept of space travel began to gain legitimacy during the post-war period. Interplanetary Flight, a textbook written by Arthur C. Clarke and illustrated by R. A. Smith, described in layman's terms what was involved in mounting an expedition to the moon. At the same time, fictional depictions of space exploration, like Charles Chilton's classic 1950s radio drama, Journey into Space, captured the imagination of the public, many of whom were now coming round to the idea that the exploration of space could soon become a reality and wished to find out more. From its conception, the BIS had a number of publications. The Journal of the British Interplanetary Society, or JBIS, is its longest surviving periodical. In the early years, a small news sheet entitled The Bulletin was also published intermittently. But as the society became established, a publication more accessible to the layman than the highly technical JBIS was needed. In 1956, the BIS launched Spaceflight. Television astronomer Patrick Moore was its first editor. Speaking by telephone from his home, he recalls how he became involved with the BIS. I became interested in astronomy at the age of six when I picked up a book belonging to my mother called The Story of the Solar System and read it and was hooked from that moment. Had a bit of luck, was a friend of ours, a member of the British Astronomical Association, and I was elected to the BAA when I was very young, only 11 years old. I said, 50 years later, I was president. At that stage, of course, space travel wasn't regarded very seriously. I'm going back now to the 1930s. But I heard about the BIS. It was interesting, so I worked off for information, and I joined it. So I joined the Internet Society before the war, and then I met many people, including, of course, Arthur Clarke, and I should know very well, so that was my introduction. In those early days, the BIS were doing some very valuable research, and some of the BIS ideas were taking fruit. And, of course, also, they were trying to get more members. And the way to do that is to bring it down to the popular level. So we had a discussion on the council, I was on the council at that time, and decided to have a go and found an entirely popular magazine to be called Space Drive. Well, I'd written various books, so I was invited to the first editor, which I did. I enjoyed doing it, I must say. I must say. Not everybody viewed the prospect of humanity expanding its realm into space favourably. In his book, Perilandra, the author C.S. Lewis criticised groups like the British Interplanetary Society for trying to export the evils of humanity to the other worlds of our solar system. Arthur C. Clarke, who was the Society's president in the post-war period, took exception to Lewis's condemnation and engaged in a correspondence which, in 1954, culminated in a meeting between Clarke and Lewis in the Eastgate pub in Oxford to discuss the issue. Clarke was accompanied to this meeting by his good friend Val Cleaver, while in Lewis's corner was one J.R.R. Tolkien. John Sherwood is a biographer and lifelong admirer of the work of Arthur C. Clarke. C.S. Lewis had been a longtime fan of science fiction, particularly the works of H.G. Wells. But as C.S. Lewis grew up, he realized that some of the things that were happening in the Wells stories and the actual possibilities that these things might take place gave him pause, and he was uncertain that some of these things should happen. C.S. Lewis portrays his particular space explorer, whose name is Weston, as a person who is totally immoral when it comes to the choices he makes. And here is a quote from Paralandra that describes this. Professor Weston had meant plenty of harm. He was a man obsessed with the idea, which is at this moment circulating all over our planet in obscure works of science fiction, and little interplanetary societies and rocketry clubs, and between the covers of monstrous magazines, ignored or mocked by the intellectuals, but ready, if ever the power is put into its hands, to open a new chapter of misery for the universe. 
And he goes on at another point and says, Weston, or forces behind Weston, will play a very important part in the events of the next few centuries, and, unless we prevent them, a very disastrous one. Arthur Clarke read Out of the Silent Planet and Paralandra uh, almost immediately after they came out, about 1943. And Arthur sat down and wrote C.S. Lewis a letter. And in that letter, he expresses what, for Arthur Clarke, is extreme indignation. Uh, He was fairly incensed. And as a leader in the British Interplanetary Society, Clarke wanted to defend this quest to bring mankind into a new frontier. So he uh, went on for several pages to defend the actions of the British Interplanetary Society and to suggest to C.S. Lewis that his own concerns were unfounded. Well, this did not change Lewis's mind, but it did begin a chain or an exchange of letters that become extremely interesting as they go on. Because after the blood had stopped boiling, Clark realized that he was dealing with a, a person of great thoughtfulness and great concern and great moral balance. The letters become extremely respectful of each other. In fact, there is almost a friendliness about them. There were no meetings at that time, and there was no suggestion of a meeting until some letters began to show up in Lewis's hands from Clark, suggesting that Lewis might give a speech to the British Interplanetary Society and defend his own views. Well, for whatever reason, uh, Lewis felt that this was not necessary, and he begged off, saying that he could not say in front of anybody anything different that he had already set down on paper in other ways. And so that, uh, that speech never occurred. And the letters more or less end sometime in the late 40s, but then they begin again in the early 1950s after uh, Clark had written a book, a novel called Childhood's End. Lewis was introduced to Childhood's End, which deals with the end of humanity, by a mutual acquaintance. He was later to describe it as his favourite work of science fiction. As it turns out, Sir Arthur and C.S. Lewis had a mutual friend, and this was Joy Davidman Gresham. This is the woman who, along with C.S. Lewis, are portrayed in the film and the play Shadowlands. Sir Arthur gives a lot of credit to Joy Davidman, rightly or wrongly, but he associates her with the information that he needed to meet at the Eastgate pub, where we happen to be sitting right now discussing this very topic some 52 years later. Arthur Clarke came to Oxford with his friend Val Cleaver, who would become eventually uh, head of the rocketry division for Rolls-Royce. So he was certainly an expert in uh, rocket engineering. Clarke was an astrophysicist, and between the two of them, they would have no problem in explaining how it would be possible to go out into space. But between the two of them, they would also be able to talk about how it could be done responsibly. Whereas on the other side of the coin, on the other side of the issue, there was C.S. Lewis. He came, of course, along with his frequent companion and friend, J.R.R. Tolkien. And I like to think of this group of people as a group of very similar men. It would have been a very interesting sight to see these four academic, reserved, yet opinionated men have this wonderful meeting of minds. And I would love to have had it be some kind of monumental sharing of thought and uh, different belief and different opinion about humankind, the universe, life, fantasy, fiction, reality, and all of the issues that had come into the head of this one difference that mankind, if given the opportunity, should he go into space and could he do it responsibly? On the one side, Cleaver and Clark saying yes. On the other side, uh, Tolkien and Lewis saying no. And I think the argument would have been fascinating had it been full-blown. Whether or not it was full-blown, we don't know. I think that what they all settled upon, perhaps, was that they were all good men, wanted to be good men. They were all very learned gentlemen and regarded each other as such, but that there was no reconciliation, perhaps, now or this night here at the East Gate that they were going to reach on this particular subject and they would just simply agree to disagree.
Clark has written about the meeting, he sums it up in about a paragraph and leads up to the final conclusion that when they parted, the four of them went out into the street, somewhat the worse for wear, suggesting that they were a little tipsy. And Lewis gave this wonderful parting shot about all of the rocket scientists and all the rocket engineers and the little interplanetary societies. He said, I'm sure you're all very wicked people, but wouldn't this be a boring world if all of us were good? At the end of World War II, the invading allies had scrambled to acquire both the advanced technology of the Nazi regime and the personnel who'd been instrumental in creating it. Foremost among their targets had been the rocket engineers and their highly developed hardware. Werner von Braun and a large number of his personnel had surrendered to the invading Americans, taking with them complete V-2 rocket systems and all the documentation associated with them. The advancing Russians had also managed to acquire large amounts of German rocket technology and some personnel and had even planned to kidnap the German rocket pioneer Eugen Zanger from Paris. Britain was unwilling to be left out of this technology bonanza and managed to acquire considerable amounts of German rocket technology and even some personnel. These were to form the foundations of its fledgling rocket programme. Nicholas Hill is the author of A Vertical Empire, which documents the rise and fall of Britain's independent rocket programme. Most of the German rocket scientists, of course, went to work for America. They realised that America had got more money than Britain had. Quite a few went up to work for the Russians, although they had rather less choice. Most of these were repatriated around about 1952 or 53. A few... German scientists came over to Britain. At the end of the Second World War, there was very little British work. We were obviously very interested in the German work, and we test-fired three V2s. After that, it rather lapsed, because Britain in the 1940s had got other priorities. Then the Russians exploded an atom bomb, and we were then looking at developing guided weapons as a means of defence. In fact, in the late 40s, guided weapons took priority over virtually everything else. There was one particular technology we picked up, which was using hydrogen peroxide, which had been the fuel for the German uh, rocket fighter, the, the ME-163. And we developed an interest in HTP, as it was referred to, for two or three reasons, partly because we wanted to build rocket aircraft ourselves. The Admiralty had an interest because HTP was thought to be useful in driving submarines underwater and also in torpedoes. The Admiralty interest disappeared because HTP, if you handle it carefully, it's safe enough, but not the sort of thing you want in a submarine. Then we discovered that the Russians were probably going to be facing missiles in Europe with atomic warheads on. The Americans were looking at building Atlas, and we thought we should get into the business too. We'd got very little to go on at that point. We hadn't really done any work. And so the main rocketry program broke into two separate stages, if you like, one of which was the Blue Streak uh, rocket, which licensed mainly American technology. And the second was using hydrogen peroxide. And from that came Black Knight and Black Arrow. But if Britain was making small steps in rocket technology, America, and even more so Russia, were making rapid progress. The primary objective was, of course, to create delivery systems for nuclear weapons. But for many of those involved in the rocket projects, there was also a secondary objective to create a vehicle capable of orbiting a spacecraft. Space historian David J. Shaler. The political background to the space race, if you want to call it that term, um, was Cold War era. It was at the end of the Second World War. Uh, former allies are now becoming rivals and um, achieving strategic and um, military gains in space or in the area of 
atmosphere, the air above territory, led to rivalry of developing rockets. And of course, this military rivalry of having the potential of a military orbital base led to this pursuit of putting satellites in orbit for spying, um, putting observation platforms up in space, weather satellites for uh, information on strategic terms, not necessarily for weather forecasting. And the funding and the um, the technology was a military operation with the US Navy, the US Army and the Soviet military arm vying for political supremacy to get the money to pay for the rockets to put them into space. Most of those people who were the instigators of that were also interested in exploring space. Von Braun was with the US Army ballistic missile team. Uh, Krolyov was involved in um, uh, development of a missile uh, for the military in Russia. And so there was this race to put the first satellite into orbit in the late 50s. Pure scientific research alone was insufficient motivation for either the US or Soviet governments to invest large amounts of money in a space programme. But a space programme as a tool of national prestige and propaganda proved to be a much more interesting proposition. While the Americans dithered and allowed inter-service rivalry to hamper their efforts, the Soviets under the secret leadership of their chief designer, Sergei Korolev, realised their plans to turn their massive R-7 intercontinental ballistic missile into a satellite launcher. On October 4, 1957, the Soviet Union shocked the world by launching the artificial satellite Sputnik 1. It was the first of a series of firsts for the Soviets which was to sting the United States into action. David Shaler again. The Americans always thought that everybody else was uh, backwards people and that they had the technical superiority over everyone else, even the English. And so the thought of a Russian capability of a vehicle flying over uh, in orbit beyond the reach of their missiles and their strategic aircraft frightened them. And certainly a couple of the early... Um, Russian cosmonauts commented that they'd never been to America, but they'd flown over it several times. And that being reported in the American press did frighten quite a few people to indicate that we, we can't have this. We've got to have an exclusion zone, basically, airspace that goes right the way through into space. German rocket pioneer Werner von Braun, now part of the American rocket program, must have been disappointed to have been upstaged by the Russians. But he was also astute enough to realise that an opportunity was presenting itself. Doug Millard. Von Braun is perceived as the archetypal German rocket boffin. What tends to be eclipsed is the other parts of what made him a very interesting man. He was a consummate organiser of people. He knew how to organise large teams of scientists and, and technologists. He was a political animal. He knew how to get things done in 1950s America. He'd been in the States, um, by and large, since the end of World War II. And he was able to observe and learn very quickly how the American system worked and he was building on his own direct experiences with a very different regime in Nazi Germany. The resultant package was someone who knew his way around the political hinterland of Washington, D.C. It was von Braun's ability to manipulate the politicians and indeed the industrial community in the United States, tremendously important when it comes to lobbying politicians and the military and then the public face. Don't forget, Von Braun worked closely with Walt Disney when a new technology, a new medium, television, was really taking off in the United States. And Von Braun knew that in order to help sell whatever he wanted of the politicians, he had to take Congress with him. And in order to do that, you had to have a public face Von Braun was a canny operator who knew how to slot his objectives 
into the social context in which he was, was living. That's why we went to the moon. Part 3. To the moon and the stars. America's embarrassment at being upstaged by the early Sputnik successes was compounded when, on the 12th of April 1961, the Soviet Union beat them in the race to become the first to place a human being in orbit. Alan Shepard's suborbital hop, three weeks later, in America's Mercury capsule, was tame by comparison. But with less than 15 minutes of manned spaceflight experience, President John F. Kennedy threw down an extraordinary challenge to the Russians. Now it is time to take longer strides. Time for a great new American enterprise. Time for this nation to take a clearly leading role in space achievement, which in many ways may hold the key to our future on Earth. We take an additional risk by making it in full view of the world. But as shown by the feet of astronaut Shepard, this very risk enhances our stature when we are successful. But this is not merely a race. Space is open to us now, and our eagerness to share its meaning is not governed by the efforts of others. We go into space because whatever mankind must undertake, free men must fully share. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. No single space project in this period will be more impressive to mankind or more important for the long-range exploration of space, and none will be so difficult or expensive to accomplish. The idea was to put a man in space as soon as possible. But there was also this program that they developed at the time called Apollo. Apollo was to be a circumlunar mission, not necessarily a landing. It was to fly out into deep space, circle around the moon and come home. They thought they would land on the moon somewhere around 1970 to 75, but it wasn't a primary goal. And that was all planned in the late 50s, early 60s. Because of Gagarin, because of the recent Bay of Pigs fiasco in Cuba, they needed something for the new president to be a star, basically. And so he asked, what could it be done? Could it be space stations? Could it be sending uh, men to Mars, men to the moon, building bigger rockets? And he was told, put a man on the moon. And so the programme to put a man on the moon by 1969 and return him safely to Earth was politically motivated by the instances of Gagarin and their plans of the programme and the errors they made out in the Bay of Pigs. With the President's endorsement of the project and the prestige of their nation at stake, America set about the task of landing on the moon by the end of the decade. With a virtually unlimited budget, the Americans began to forge ahead, firstly completing the one-man Mercury programme, then moving on to the two-man Gemini programme, a project intended to develop and refine the techniques which would be required by the Apollo lunar programme. The Soviets continued to achieve space firsts. The first lunar probe and lander, the first orbiting of two spacecraft simultaneously, and the first woman in space. But by the time Alexei Leonov became the first human being to walk in space in 1965, their manned space programme had effectively stalled. The Soviets would not orbit another human being until 1967, and that flight would end in disaster. Despite their massive budget and seemingly limitless resources, the Americans were also to encounter tragic losses. David Shaler again. The Russians initially said, we don't want to go, we don't want to race, we're not interested. Secretly, they were already developing their moon programme. They had their large launch vehicle being designed. They had a programme to go, but it was being delayed. In the meantime, the Americans had certainly worked hard and they was learning how to live and work in space over a period of time, 14 days, rendezvous and docking, and they were extremely successful. But at the same time, they were 
having a change of president because of the assassination of Kennedy. They were having a change of administrations. They were also having problems with the Vietnam War being developed that was drawing resources and funds and also political and public support away from a space program to support a war in Southeast Asia. And so they was not cutting corners, but they was trying to get there very quick. The consequences uh, of one of them was that there was a pad fire in 1967 through bad management, lack of forethought, lack of uh, engineering skills on the fire in the spacecraft that claimed three Apollo astronauts in 1967. Ironically, the first Soyuz uh, flight in April 1967 uh, ended in tragedy as well uh, because the spacecraft wasn't ready. They had had several unmanned spacecraft that had failed, but they still pushed with the manned vehicle. And as soon as it got in orbit, it had problems, and it it resulted in the death of Komarov through a parachute failure. In the final stage of the descent, the jets seemed to be playing some strange tune. They pulsed on and off, making the last fine adjustments to the thrust. Abruptly, a swirling cloud of dust hid everything. The jets gave one final spurt, and the shuttle rocked very slightly, like a rowboat when a small wave goes by. It was some minutes before Floyd could really accept the silence that now enfolded him and the weak gravity that gripped his limbs. He had made, utterly without incident and in little more than one day, the incredible journey of which men had dreamed for 2,000 years. After a normal routine flight, he had landed on the moon. BIS President Arthur C. Clarke's seminal work of science fiction, 2001, A Space Odyssey, was published in 1968. In that same year, science fact finally caught up with science fiction. In December, Apollo 8 became the first manned spacecraft to leave Earth and travel across the 240,000-mile gulf of space to orbit the Moon. For the first time in history, human beings gazed with their own eyes on the far side of the Moon and back across the void to distant Earth. The profound nature of the moment seemed to be epitomised by a single event during the mission. For all the people back on Earth, the crew of Apollo 8 has a message that we would like to send to you. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light. That it was good. And from the crew of Apollo 8, we close with good night, good luck, a Merry Christmas, and God bless all of you, all of you on the good earth. Seven months after Apollo 8's crew's reading from the book of Genesis, the crew of Apollo 11 turned the dream of generations into reality. 100 feet, three and a half down, nine forward. 875 feet, that's looking good, down a half. Six forward. 30 seconds. Lights on, forward. Forward. 40 feet down, two and a half. Picking up some dust. Face shadow. Four forward, drift into the right a little. Contact light. Okay, engine stop. 413 is in. We copy you down, Eagle. Houston, uh, Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. Roger, Twain. Tranquility. We copy you on the ground. You got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. We're breathing again. Thanks a lot. Okay, Neil, we can see you coming down the ladder now. Okay, I just checked uh, getting back up to that first step. Uh, it's a uh, pretty good little jump. I'm uh, at the foot of the ladder. The lamb footbeds are only uh, depressed in the surface about uh, one or two inches. 
come now. Step off the limb now. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. For the British Interplanetary Society, the 1950s and 60s were halcyon days, seeing so much of what had been speculated about in the pre-war years becoming a reality. But even during the 1950s, the idea of sending expeditions to the moon was still treated with scepticism by many. For the believers within the BIS, though, the question was not if, but when. Patrick Moore remembers the debate clearly. Well, I remember having a long discussion with Arthur Clarke about that. He said before 1970, I said between 1980 and 1990. Of course, he was right and I was wrong. I remember seeing Gagarin for the first time. I could talk to him direct, and I liked it very much. Then, of course, up went John Lenn, the uh, Alan Shepard first, and then John Lenn. And during the 1960s, space travel really took off. Space stations, rendezvous, and of course then the men on the moon. I know that very well indeed. Reginald Turnhill was the BBC's aerospace correspondent from 1956 to 1970 and was in a position to observe firsthand the momentous events of that era. But the joy of recalling those epic voyages to the moon is tinged with regret for things that might have been. Well, of course, people of my age have been extremely fortunate. Uh, it would be nice not to be 90, but to be 20 again. But the fact is that uh, people of my generation who were able to report uh, and enjoy the moon landings, the first man in space, Yuri Gagarin onwards, uh, right up to um, the beginning of the shuttle missions, uh, we've been very lucky indeed. When Apollo 11 made the first moon landing, I did a broadcast on the BBC forecasting a great race to Mars between America and Russia and giving an actual date in, in I think it was 1984, when one could expect the first man to step on Mars. Of course, this was not to be. And uh, speaking here in 2005, I would guess that the first man won't step on Mars now, perhaps for another 50 years. Britain had neither the political will nor the resources to become involved in a space race. Throughout the 1950s and 60s, the fortunes of Britain's fledgling rocket programme ebbed and flowed with changing political administrations. Towards the end of the 1950s, it became obvious that there were deep misgivings about the possibility of Britain's nuclear missile system, Blue Streak, ever becoming an effective deterrent. The Blue Streak missile project was cancelled in 1960, but continued for a number of years at a minimal level of funding, with the prospect of eventually creating a satellite launcher system. The job of providing Britain's nuclear deterrent was to be carried out initially by aircraft in the form of Britain's V Bomber Force and then by submarine using the American Polaris system. The production of a satellite launcher system became mired in European politics as Britain became involved in the ELDO project, as Nicholas Hill explains. Having failed to develop Blue Streak as a satellite launcher ourselves and wanting to get into Europe, we proposed the idea of this European launcher. Entirely a British idea. Well, the French were interested in working with us, but the British at the time said, no, we're going to make this joint European project. Negotiations were very slow and very painful. A lot of people in Europe weren't that keen on the idea, but we got the show up and running. Then the government that had got it up and running, who were the Conservative government in the early 60s, they lost office and the Labour Party came in. The Wilson government wanted to cut down the expenditure on what it regarded as prestige projects, Concord, Eldo, all these other programmes such as TSR2. It couldn't cancel Concord and Eldo because they were under treaty with other countries, so it was stuck with them. This didn't make the government very happy, so they became less and less enthusiastic partners. 
The next thing that happened was that the French said, look, the launcher we are developing, it's not really going to be very adequate. What you want to do is to start again with a liquid hydrogen design. The British government then dug their heels in and said, we have committed ourselves to building this launcher. We are not going to build any other launcher. So Eldo was forced to go down the road of building a technically inadequate launcher simply because the British government were not prepared to either change course or withdraw. And I think the British government were basically hoping that Eldo would collapse. It wasn't helped by the way Eldo was run, because it's a political organisation. There was no one in overall technical command. And so the British would go out with their rocket, and the French would go out with their rocket and their bit, and their manuals written in French, and the Germans with their bit and their manuals written in German, and the Australians would have to be faced with the task of putting it all together, so that we would launch our bit and get it working, then we'd try it with the French bit and a couple of failures there, and then with the German bit and a couple of failures there. And you're up to 1969, five or six years after you started, you spent an awful lot of money, you haven't got a working launcher. Britain's involvement with large liquid-fuelled rockets came to an end with the fourth and final firing of the entirely British-developed Black Arrow launcher. It turned out to be a textbook launch. Uh, it put Prospero into orbit, Prospero weighing 66 kilograms. It was designed mainly as a test satellite. The trouble was we had just then had another change of government. The Heath government came in in 1970 and the Treasury again saw its chance to nobble a new set of ministers and say this programme is costing us money, it's not worth it, there is no economic return. So just as Prospero was being fired, the government decided no more, this is going to be the last one. There was yet another fifth black arrow which was virtually complete by this stage. That was never fired, that's taken off the Science Museum and you can see it there hanging from the ceiling today. As Britain's rocket programme quietly ceased to exist, the British Interplanetary Society undertook arguably the most influential of its programme of groundbreaking theoretical studies. At the beginning of the 1970s, the Society began what was to become probably the most detailed and in-depth study of the problems of interstellar travel ever undertaken. Alan Bond, Tony Martin and Robert Parkinson were instrumental in the setting up of the Daedalus project. First, Alan Bond. Back in the early 1970s, I had uh, written a paper for the BIS on uh, interstellar flight, pulling together my own thoughts. And following that, Tony Martin wrote to me and said that he'd also been working on interstellar flight, but both of us, particularly the propulsion, not other aspects of the flight. The uh, problem was actually making things go fast enough. And uh, I entered into a dialogue with Tony and we spent quite a lot of time talking about those sort of things. But it wasn't until Bob Parkinson dropped me a letter one day uh, regarding the feasibility of an interstellar mission. We met one another at a BIS meeting and the topic came to not just interplanetary flight but how you might do interstellar flight. And I went home and wrote Alan a long letter about all the possibilities that you might have about getting uh, to a nearby star. And I remember distinctly, I was lying in bed one Saturday morning and sort of read Bob's letter. And I'd done a throwaway line in the middle of it that said, you won't be interested in this because you can't stop at the other end. So there really isn't much point in that, is there? And I thought, well, yeah, there could be. And Alan said, hang on a minute, all the early space probes didn't stop at the planets they flew past. So why do we have to stop at the other end? And I talked to Tony about it, and Tony and myself then approached uh, Len Carter at the British Interplanetary Society. Len Carter had already been uh, considering that he wanted to launch a project in this area. It was one of Len Carter's own personal interests. And it went from there, really, Tony, as I recall it. You got in touch with some people. Yep. We had a formal meeting beginning of 73. That's right, 1973, Caxton Hall, yeah. Caxton Hall, yeah. And formally proposed that under the umbrella of the BIS that we'd carry out a study. So would the Daedalus project have been possible without the British Interplanetary Society? We could have done it. 
without the BIS, but I don't think it ever occurred to us not to no. do it under the umbrella yeah. of the BIS. I think it was a natural way of approaching something, an idea like that. The purpose of the BIS really is to provide a forum for people to exchange ideas, which are normally done through technical papers. There is, however, something slightly special because it's the British Interplanetary Society that allowed Daedalus and the early studies to operate, which is that we're not a very large community in the UK. And that means that we meet one another at BIS meetings and know one another. And the BIS has acted as a focus the people that worked on it, they were all from the BIS, they'd been motivated by the BIS. Tony and myself clearly led the project and we went round with sort of sharp sticks and made everybody deliver their papers and things like that. In the end. To... <laughs> In the end. It took a while. <laughs> Most of the initial calculations were done on slide rules and using log tables. Yeah. It was only about three years into the project that um, affordable pocket calculators first appeared on the market and was it an hp 35 you turned up it wasn't even that it wasn't (laughs) wasn't even that no we were looking for engineers physicists but the overriding skill was innovation we'd already decided that we were going to look at a whole mission we were going to adopt the stellar flyby and so we decided that we'd we'd go for the whole thing you know from soup to nuts so to speak uh we'd we'd look at the propulsion the structure the logistics of how it would come about We'd look at the payload, what science could actually be achieved with something travelling to a significant fraction of the speed of light as it went by another uh, stellar system. We also sort of needed to do some astronomy because at that point in time it was great saying we're going to do an interstellar mission, but when we started off we hadn't got a clue where this mission was going to be destined for or uh, how we would decide what the mission was. So, for example, a chap named Harvey Mattingson who had got... uh, uh, some astronomical background, he was actually a physicist, uh, sorted out what the strategy should be for selecting targets. We did a survey of the uh, nearest stars and uh, looked at their characteristics and uh, relevancy for uh, science and uh, possibilities of planets and uh, characteristics of stars, whether there would be any possibility of uh, life on those planets or whether that was ruled out by the stellar characteristics did a ranking of the systems and uh, we thought we'd take all those factors into account and out of that ranking we picked the final target which was Barnard's star which is was I think third on the ranking uh, by a very short way um, but it looked uh, to be the most interesting. The other skills that we were looking for were, were people who just would be up to uh, tackling the rather sort of different design issue of uh, an interstellar vehicle. Uh, We had a couple of engineers, a chap named Tony White and another guy named John Parfitt, and they rallied to that task. They'd been involved in missile design work and so on. And uh, they really took that on board uh, quite strongly. And also we got dear Jim Strong involved uh, Jim's no longer with Written us. Written one of the few books at that time on interstellar travel, That's interstellar right. flight. Yeah. We used to have a lot of fun with Jim because uh, Daedalus uh, always finished up with just a flat erosion shield. Tony designed the erosion shield for the uh, front. Jim decided he would do the drawings and every time it came back with a point on it so we'd take the point off and send it back and... Uh, I think uh, this happened several times before we could persuade Jim. It really didn't have to have a point on it, but poor old Jim said, it just doesn't look right. You can't have a spaceship which doesn't have a a pointed end on it. Anyway, we did finally persuade him to leave the point off. (laughs) In the pre-internet, pre-email 1970s, face-to-face meetings were essential. And as with so many other aspects of the society's history, Part of the Daedalus Group's activities involved visiting public houses. They looked at where everybody lived and found the centre of the circle, as it were, which was the pub called The Rising Sun at Aston Clinton, which is about two miles down the road from here. And so from time to time, we used to gather in the pub at Aston Clinton and take over a corner of the pub with beer and drawings. And I'm not quite sure what the pub made of us. (laughs) A number of propulsion systems were considered for the Daedalus project, 
but the one finally selected was a laser-ignited nuclear pulse propulsion system. Essentially what that is, is uh, you eject um, small uh, nuclear pulse units um, out the back of the vehicle, um, ignite them somehow so that there's a nu small nuclear explosion, and the momentum produced by that nuclear explosion is then what drives your spaceship forward. In the old Orion system, which was around in the 1950s, um, the, those explosions were actually um, small, low-yield um, atomic bombs. The high knuckles and wood work was for small fusion explosions ignited by, using, by the use of very high-power laser beams. We did continue to look at different propulsion systems, um, but in the context of the Daedalus study for a simple one-way flyby mission, there was really no alternative to the nuclear pulse propulsion system. The thing that I got interested in was how you actually got the propellant, because there was this huge quantity of uh, fusion propellants that you needed to get to the stars, thousands of tonnes of it, uh, including the rare isotope helium-3. So I wound up looking at how you might get that and eventually invented the idea of sky mining the Jupiter atmosphere for helium-3. Right at the outset, it's clear that uh, we weren't going to get up to more than some relatively small fraction of the speed of light. I think in the end we got to about 16% with a, a lot of trial. And uh, it was quite clear that this was going to take the uh, span of somebody's career in order to carry out the mission. That wasn't too much of a problem because missions not too dissimilar to that are already in progress. So the Pioneer missions, 10, 11, they've been now in flight for 40 years. Mm and uh, they're out into interstellar space already. So that fixed the two main parameters. The mission was to Barnard Star. We were going to take 50 years to do it. it meant we'd got to get up to about 16% of the speed of light. The vehicle was a two-stage vehicle, and the boost phase of the actual vehicle itself was uh, a couple of years per stage, something like that. And the objective was to project a payload through what at that time we believed to be another stellar planetary system and during an encounter which we knew was only going to last you know, from one side to the other two days at the outside uh, 40 hours I think was the actual figure we got to make as many measurements as possible and what that involved is trying to detect any uh, planets at the time and then launch components of the payload on trajectories that would take you close to any interesting bodies that there, there were there. And the whole payload would then go streaking through the system and out the other side and then be lost in sort of interstellar space after the mission was completed. If you stood back and didn't look at the detail but just looked at the overall project, we by and large I think would still say we got that reasonably right. Mm. A, Nuclear pulse propelled vehicle, I think Tony and myself would still say, is a near term prospect. In terms of the type of mission, it's clear that many missions like that have been flown already within the solar system, many more than there were when we first did the study. And the sort of flyby type investigation of near stellar bodies is almost certainly going to be the way that the first extraterrestrial missions are flown. I don't doubt that sooner or later somebody will find a way of getting sufficient energy or propulsion on board to slow it down and uh, genuinely go to explore another star. But I, I would say that as a type of mission, that that's probably still the way that we would think we might look at the engineering differently and the physics differently or whatever, but uh, that's still the way that I think it would go. The physicist Enrico Fermi postulated a strange conundrum, now known as the Fermi Paradox. He asked the question, why, when there are potentially billions of habitable planets in our galaxy, are we not constantly being visited by alien cultures? Could one of the reasons be that interstellar travel is simply a practical impossibility? It focused my mind on the Fermi paradox much more closely, because here we were actually designing a starship, and um, one of the sort of possible explanations for the Fermi paradox is that starships aren't possible. 
uh, that was immediately faced down in the dust after we'd got past the initial set of calculations. A lot of the work we did was driven to address different aspects of that paradox to see if we could find a way, a way out of it, a solution to it. Mm -hmm. Is there some area that actually explains the paradox? And I don't think we'd have gone necessarily down that route if it hadn't been for Daedalus. Well, I, I don't think all of us involved would have had the, uh, I will use the word, stark realisation of where we stand in relation to the universe. Yes, you sort of see it, you can think about it in the comfort of your own home and on your settee, but uh, when you've actually sat down as a team and designed a vehicle and really put your best into saying, what can I actually do, recognising that we've only just achieved the technological capability to do that, I think it impressed on all of us this uh, incredible uh, uh, problem as to if there's anybody else out there, why aren't they turning up? The British Interplanetary Society was already highly respected within the cloistered world of astronautics. But the release of the Daedalus study brought it to the attention of a much wider audience. When the Daedalus report appeared, it fell, if you like, on fertile ground because it was Star Trek days and uh, all this sort of business. Yes, it attracted a lot of attention. A lot of um, the written attention it attracted was abysmal. On the list of articles we had, we would use the word poor. That, that is not actually the word we used <laughs> <laughs> in speech referring to them. There were some good um, broadcasts. The one in particular I've got is Spaceships for the Mind, yeah, Nigel. Nigel Calder, which had models made of uh, Daedalus with its uh, cylindrical fuel tanks and things like that that Alan was <laughs> fondly clutching. Really, it was, it, was a, it was a project for its time, I guess is what I'm saying. And if it, if it did enhance the visibility of the BIS, then that was a, a great spin-off from the programme. Um, I don't think it enhanced the reputation of the BIS. I think that was already there. We know that the study itself has been influential, not just with the people at the BIS and the people that designed it, but uh, we have had a lot of feedback from people at NASA, and in particular the, uh, the people who are now at the centre that's called Glenn. Um, what impressed them was just the uh, comprehensive nature of the study, the fact that we looked at everything from the propulsion system, the payload, and the, down to the power system that supplied the electrical power supply for the payload. Len Carter, at the end of the study, um, he was talking to us on one occasion and uh, he said the thing that had really stuck in his mind, the thing that really impressed him, was he knew about the light years and he knew about the speed and he knew about the uh, millions of tonnes of TNT equivalent in the propulsion, but what really, really impressed him was the amount of beer that we drunk during the course of the project. The Society's tradition of theoretical studies has continued into the new millennium. Charles Cockell was a member of the British Antarctic Survey team and, with the support of the BIS, has conducted Project Boreas, a study of the problems of establishing a base at the Martian polar regions. I've had a long interest in the polar regions of Mars. In fact, in 1995, I published a paper called The Polar Exploration of Mars in the Journal of the British Interplanetary Society, which was looking at um, the design of a Martian polar base and expeditions on the Martian poles. And I suppose this really ties into my polar interests, life in the extremes, but also the fact that Mars has polar ice caps. Uh, the northern polar ice cap is about a quarter of the size of Antarctica. You can imagine that one day this polar ice cap will be the stage on which great expeditions will occur. People will attempt unsupported assaults on the Martian uh, North Geographic Pole, purely as feats of exploration as well as a scientific interest in the Martian polar ice caps. And so it seemed to me uh, one of the logical steps or one of the key steps in Martian polar exploration at some point in the future will be the construction of a Martian polar base, uh, whether that's at the edge of the pole or at the Martian North Pole itself. And the British Interplanetary Society has a long history of doing these types of space exploration projects. So I thought this would be a good one for them to do, and hence the reason for setting this project up and the reason why it got going. 
The polar regions are interesting because they may contain within them uh, organics, possibly even life, if there was ever life on Mars, at least remnants of that life stored like a deep freezer in the ice caps. But also the ice caps have, are made up of these layered terrains. These are these layers of um, ice and dust that goes back, go back many tens of millions of years and may reveal insights into the past climate of Mars, if you can imagine standing on the polar ice cap and drilling into the ice cap and bringing out a long core and then looking at the ice and dust within this core and getting an understanding of the history of Mars. So there are enormous scientific reasons for wanting to go to, uh, a number of scientific reasons for wanting to go to the Martian polar ice caps because of the uh, past history of Mars, possible signatures of life, but if nothing more, to look at the past climate. Another reason why I think that the British Interplanetary Society would be uh, uh, interested in this project is because, of course, Britain has a long history of polar exploration, made significant contributions to polar exploration, uh, explorations of Antarctica and the Arctic as well. Uh, those contributions have uh, given Britain uh, a, a technical expertise, but also, uh, again, a sense of historical continuity, uh, applying British vision and expertise to the Martian poles is something that represents a continuity of uh, Britain's vision of polar exploration before. In fact, there's a, a recent book out called Ice in the English Imagination, which describes this bizarre obsession the British have for crossing these terrible regions of the Earth's poles and sacrificing their lives for these ridiculous exploration objectives. So <laughs> exploring the Martian poles is... Uh, I don't think it's frivolous to say it's really a continuity of, of a British national persona. It's part of our public, uh, it's, it's part of our national personality. And I think it's fun to design a Martian polar base and to think about how you would live at the Martian polar ice caps. Part four. Towards an uncertain future. At the beginning of the 1980s, the Soviet space programme was still shrouded in mystery. It was then that a series of annual forums started, which brought together experts in the field from across the globe. Rex Hall, president of the BIS from 2003 to 2006, was instrumental in establishing the Soviet Symposium, as one of the world's foremost venues for sharing information about the enigmatic activities of the Eastern Bloc countries. It wasn't really until I met Anthony Kendon. Anthony was then, I think, on the programme committee. And we began to form this little group of people, Phil Clark, myself, Anthony Kendon, three or four other people. We used to meet up occasionally in the pub by Colette's in uh, Tottenham Court Road. And we used to have a drink and swap what was happening on the Russian space programme, Soviet space programme. You know, what was going to be launched, who was going to fly, whatever. Oh, God, did we make mistakes. And then Anthony, uh, who at that time was uh, doing some work on the American military stuff, said, well, why don't we have a Soviet meeting at the BIS? And he convinced Len Carter, uh, the then executive secretary, to hold this meeting. If I remember, the first one was a Friday night, Saturday. It was sort of three sessions. Um, and there must have been about 30, 35 people there. Jeff Perry was the speaker. Phil Clark was the speaker. Anthony was. Uh, there were a number of people. John Parfit, uh, who had written articles in Flight magazine in the 60s about the power of Soviet rocketry and Nick Johnson came over from the States for it I mean it was tremendous and I sat in the audience in awe of me you know of meeting these people for the first time and uh, Anthony was sadly killed in a car crash and they wanted someone else to organize the Russian meeting and for some reason I think probably because I was the only person based in London I guess they asked me and said would I do it and I said yeah all right. For the first few years, we always had a representative of the Soviet embassy in the audience. And one year, this man called John Brannigan, who lived somewhere in the north of Scotland and had clearly worked as a naval officer on our nuclear submarine programme, but he recorded uh, the transmissions from the space stations. 
and he played this tape of the Russian cosmonauts talking because they used an open mic system on the space station. And he started to interpret sounds. So he said, now listen to this sound. This is them turning on such and such a machine because they report down that they've just turned on so-and-so and this is the, what the machine's noise is. And he played it. He could play the transmission because he said, clearly, when they're near a mic, they just shout. Or in these one or two cases, they obviously have throat mics and some crews just leave it on, the whole of the mission, chatting away or whatever. And next year he came back and he said within two days of the forum, they'd actually stopped the system and we're now and it started operating a specific transmission sequence. And we all looked at the Russian, right? Who smiled. <laughs> and uh, and uh, I always remember that. I thought, wow, we are having an influence on the, on, on the space program. Um, also, it was interesting that, that someone like Boris Belitsky, who was then the voice of Radio Moscow, uh, in a number of broadcasts in the 80s, said if you wanted to find out anything about the Russian space program, you should write to the British Interplanetary Society, who knew more about it publicly than they did. You know. The metamorphosis of the BIS into a respected professional body allowed it to have a voice in some very influential circles. As early as 1946, the Society had proposed a project for a man-carrying rocket to Britain's Ministry of Supply and in 1960 had made a set of recommendations to Harold Macmillan's government on Britain's involvement with the European Space Programme. But there were those who felt that the move from being a club for enthusiastic amateurs into a professional, worthy body marginalised many of those members who were not employed in the aerospace industry. Rex Hall, who was the first president without a scientific qualification, recalls that even for groundbreaking events like the early Soviet symposia, the society could seem less than welcoming to its non-professional members. We met for, I think, an hour and a half on the Friday night and then we met again on the Saturday and we were thrown out at lunchtime. I always remember that. Very odd. We did 10 to 12 and there was a lunch break and there was no facilities to have lunch. But they wouldn't even give us a cup of coffee. So they shut for two hours. And we went to the pub and came back again at two and started again. And I thought that was just bizarre. And actually that went on for three or four years before we persuaded them that it would be rather nice just to have a coffee at lunchtime. And, and nothing to do with lunch, but just a coffee, let alone lunch. I know that in 1984 there was a serious schism in the society. Perhaps a uh, power struggle is, is the correct word to use between the then existing council and a group of people who... Uh, wanted to take it over, I'm sure for laudable reasons. BBC space correspondent Reginald Turnhill was one of those unhappy with the running of the society. The main problem, I think, was that the old guard was very fond of saying uh, that it was a, a professional body and they didn't like the idea of young people uh, coming in and they, the beautiful headquarters uh, at... Uh, Vox Hall, very fine headquarters, became a sort of private club for the committee uh, and not available to the ordinary rank and file members. And I feel very strongly, I suppose, be, being a media man, uh, that uh, there should be involvement of every member. This, the youngest and newest member, I felt, should have access to this beautiful headquarters. There were a lot of people like me. Uh, unfortunately, most of them resigned, uh, so that the efforts of uh, people like myself to improve it uh, were hampered by the fact that most people who wanted to improve it had resigned. It very much looked as if it was a gentleman's club. There is a set of portraits on the top floor of the BIS of all the past presidents, and you, you look at them and they're all there in their suits, many of them holding cigarettes or pipes in their mouth and uh, whatever. And you just get a feeling of this learned society. 
I think it's gone through some very bad times. I'm sure that we've got to expand the envelope to bring in people who care about space, care about the BIS, but actually you have never worked in British Aerospace or EDS or been near a mathematical equation. John Harlow, who became president in 2006, is a long-standing member of the council and able to take a long-term view of the changes the society has undergone. If I try and stand back from all this I, and look back, I can't remember now when I was first on council, probably 1980s, there were certainly people there who were either in the satellite build industry or in the aerospace industry or in good old rocket propulsion. I think the ethos has changed, but I said to myself, well, what are the aims and the objectives of the society? And if one sits back and says, well, maybe it's to spread the word, to educate, to facilitate, then you don't need rocket engineers. They may have some original thoughts. Uh, they will be able to network amongst people if you want to run a symposium on some technical subject or other then there is no doubt that they their old boy network system is still very useful but apart from that um no maybe we do need more educators educate the last of america's apollo astronauts walked on the moon in december 1972 to be followed by the highly successful series of Skylab space station missions. The last Apollo mission flew in 1975, with the first ever docking of an American and Soviet spacecraft in the Apollo-Soyuz test project. The Soviet space programme had finally recovered from a series of crippling setbacks the program had floundered rudderless following the death of its influential chief designer, Sergei Korolev. While it remained unacknowledged for more than 20 years, the Soviets pursued their own manned lunar project. There were three unsuccessful attempts to launch Saturn V-sized rockets. With Neil Armstrong's small step in 1969, the Soviets began to turn their attention closer to home with a series of space station projects. David Shaler. The problem with Skylab, you couldn't resupply it. You had to carry all your equipment with you or you had to launch it with the space station. What the Russians realised, that if you could launch a space station with more than one docking port and then supply it with a ferry vehicle that could bring up more food, more equipment and more oxygen or more fuel, you could keep your space station flying. You could also change out your crew in. So you could keep people on orbit in space stations all the time. And that's what they tested on Salyut 6 and 7 in the late... 70s early 80s that they had a space station was up there for several years and by sending the progress unmanned resupply vehicle to it they could send fresh supplies and also use that as a trash can to bring back all the rubbish you don't want to burn it up in the atmosphere it also meant prolonged science instead of turning equipment on and off when the crew came home you could keep it going and if you could learn to re rotate your crews, you didn't need to turn off your space station. They couldn't really do that on the Salyuts because they had difficulty in maintaining the manning of it. They had other problems. But they started doing that with the Mir space station from 1986, where they had a continual 10-year crew on board uh, made up of different cosmonauts uh, throughout the life of the space station. Looking beyond the Apollo era, NASA had presented the US government with an ambitious plan for future development, which echoed the Werner von Braun-inspired vision outlined in a series of articles in the magazine Colliers in the 1950s. But of those ambitious plans, very little survived, as space historian Andy Salmon explains. Really, even going back to the 1950s, to the Collier's articles of ways of getting into space and doing big things in space, NASA, in a way, after getting as far as going to the moon, making the first successful landing on the moon, they were looking at what to do after Apollo. And they were following the same track as was following in Collier's. You want a reusable craft to go into orbit. Its job there is to shuttle components and shuttle crews up to a space station. 
So reusable craft first, second is the, spa is the space station. Then the third objective is to have a mission out to the planets, Mars in particular. So reusable craft, space station, mission to the planet. The shuttle ended up being the only thing they funded, looking at what would happen after Apollo. They looked at all three of these things and decided in the end they didn't want a space station, they couldn't afford mission to the planets, but we'll have a space shuttle because that could be used to launch lots of satellites. While the shuttle was a brave attempt to move away from expendable launchers, it soon became clear that the system was fundamentally flawed, a fact graphically demonstrated one cold January morning in 1986. Challenger, go with throttle up. Roger, go with throttle up. Fido trajectory. Go ahead. Flight JC, we've had uh, negative contact, lost bailing. Okay, all operators, watch your data carefully. Flight Fido, go ahead. RSO reports vehicle exploded. Copy. After Challenger disaster, they took all of the commercial satellite launches off the space shuttle. They still had a few military launches. They had mostly things like the space labs, the scientists in space to do research in space, in weightlessness, in microgravity. And they were launching planetary missions, things like Ulysses to go around the Sun, or Galileo to go to Jupiter, or the Hubble Space Telescope. The Soviet Union also built and tested, in a single uncrewed flight, their own version of a space shuttle. But it quickly became apparent that they had neither the missions nor the resources to maintain such a massive programme. Into the new millennium, the Russian space programme continues to rely on its tried and tested workhorse, the Soyuz spacecraft. Throughout the 70s and 80s, the Russians continued to build up their experience of spaceflight, initially in a series of temporary space stations, and ultimately in the long-term facility Mir. By 1986, they were confident enough to want to launch a base block, the first module, and then launch an add-on module, just a small one to start with. And then slowly, as the years went by, they added extra 20-ton modules, there were modules called Kvant, Kvant 2, Priorda, Spekta. So all these modules linked together and launched together successfully. The optimism for cooperation in space after the 1975 Apollo-Soyuz test project evaporated in the realism of the continuing Cold War. But when relations began to thaw following the fall of the Berlin Wall in the early 1990s, the prospect of international cooperation again became realistic. In 1995, 20 years after ASTP, a docking took place between an American and a Soviet spacecraft. June 1995 marks a pivotal moment in human spaceflight when the space shuttle Atlantis approached the Mir space station and docked and then the hatch opened and the commander of the shuttle, Hoot Gibson, and the commander of the Mir space station, Vladimir Dezirov, approached each other floating in space inside the Mir space station, shook hands and it marked the confluence of the former Soviet and the American space programs at that time, the joint together of the Mir and the space shuttle programs, which would lead in the future to the International Space Station. The necessity for human beings to be directly involved in space exploration has been debated since the beginning of the space age. Many believe the enormous costs and risks involved cannot be justified. By the first decade of the new millennium, automated probes have visited every planet in our solar system except Pluto. And satellites orbiting the Earth provide round-the-clock communications, navigation, weather reports, military surveillance and much more. But, for very good reasons, the concept 
of the unmanned exploration of the solar system was one which never even occurred to the early pioneers of the British Interplanetary Society, as Robert Parkinson explains. It's only now, looking back, to see how important and successful unmanned space was. The electronics revolution meant that some of the other things that had been expected suddenly turned out to be a lot easier. Classic case being Arthur Clarke's communication satellites. When Arthur Clarke invented the idea of a communication satellite, he thought that basically it was going to be building three broadcasting stations in orbit, fully manned for the people to change the valves. <laughs> and as a consequence, it was going to involve building space stations in low Earth orbit and <laughs> all the, the rest of the, the infrastructure. By the early 1970s, you could build a relay satellite that you could launch on an existing rocket that competed economically with transatlantic cables, and all of a sudden, geosynchronous orbit was crowded with unmanned vehicles. And the same thing's true all the way, that, that unmanned vehicles have been incredibly successful. The manned systems we've learnt are more difficult than we expected, and the way that, that things have worked out is, has really been very surprising as against the way that people expected things to happen. happen. Thank you for the opportunity to, to join you this evening. And um, I want to thank uh, Dave as uh, well as... Jack In the Society's Paul meeting for, room, uh, veteran NASA astronaut and, uh, Jack Lusma begins an evening lecture. Country. And the BIS has come a long way since its founders held their meetings in members' homes, borrowed offices and public houses. The Society's headquarters, since 1979, have been an imposing three-storey building on the south bank of the Thames, just around the corner from the Oval Cricket Ground. Suzanne Parry is the Society's Executive Secretary and it's on her shoulders that the responsibility for the day-to-day -day running of the organisation falls. Because we're a charity, we're run by committees, so therefore I have to answer to the committees and carry out all the jobs that they state in, in their meetings. So, say for the programme committee, I would have to organise the evening lectures, symposia, Financial and General Purposes Committee, then I have to report each month on the budget, how we're going, how the income's coming from the membership. The publications, Space Flight's done by Mary McGivin and JBS by Ben Jones. Just make sure that, uh, that you know the work's coming in for them and that they're carrying it out and keeping to the schedules. Um, downstairs, the membership office is run by Marilyn Marsland and she enters the money and sends out the things that you all request. For the membership, we're trying to entice new members and obviously keep the members that we've, we've got. BIS members are very different. You get the professional, um, the people that actually work in the industry as well. Then you just get the general person that's got a, a general interest and wants to you know, find out more. We have students that are obviously are trying to get into the field of astronautics and engineering. We have astronauts, cosmonauts, just from every walk of life, really. Problems I foresee the society facing are one major one at the moment is the upkeep of the building. Um, the last time we had it overhauled was back in 1987, and um, we do have problems on the top floor with the flat roof and the roof itself causing damp. Um, the second major problem is our membership and it is decreasing each year um, and that is really, really important because their support sustains the society in being where it is today. For BIS presidents like Rex Hall, the challenge is to keep the society relevant, to reflect the mood and interest of its members and to continue to keep them informed of current developments in the world of space exploration. A new series of symposia dedicated to the emerging Chinese programme is just one example of how that need for information is being serviced. We have started, of course, running 
uh, in a way, part-time symposiums on the Chinese space program. We've got two members, Brian Harvey and Phil Clark, who know more about the Chinese space program than most people do in the West. Brian has written two books now on the program. And when we publicised it, we had a third speaker come forward called Kelvin Platt, who is in fact the head of the Ministry of Defence Space Department. And he's talked, uh, the first talk was on the seven building blocks that China needed to do on the manned space programme. And in fact, it is the manned programme that has been the catalyst, though in fact we do cover other elements of their programme, recovery satellites or... Uh, similar things. But actually, it is the manned programme that is of most interest to people. Like almost any privately funded society, the BIS has its own problems and challenges. One is defining the society's role in a world which has changed radically since the beginning of the space age. Rex Hall again. I think clearly in the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, there was a very clear purpose. I think that where it was about influencing government, it was about the fact that the majority of the senior figures in British space were members of the society. We had a clear role. It was clearly defined. But now we don't seem to have a British national space programme and accordingly we don't have a voice. The fact that many senior members in the space industry were part of the BIS meant that you joined because it helped you. Now, I don't think it does help you. I don't think having FBIS after your name is worth a light, really. We have about 3,000 members. Over half come from abroad, uh, mainly in America, but more and more in Europe. We lose 10 to 15% every year. The profile, as someone pointed out to me the other day, seems to be on the elderly side. So the struggle... To retain membership is hard, and to build on membership is very difficult. I think the BIS is going to struggle in future years to retain a membership base that allows it to be economically viable. I'm very proud that we published more probably historical articles defining what went on now, that we have glasnost, perestroika, there's an opening up in America a bit of the 60s. I think that's good. I think we've got to balance it against our need to be a technical organisation and the fact that JBIS is now a citation index publication, which means that it counts towards your points for professorships and doctorates and new grades. That's important. It's important that we have symposium that does move the debate forward about the future of space, the future of technology. Mars is exciting. Space tourism has the potential to be exciting. Uh, we've got to balance these things and it's not at the moment easy to do so. It's not easy to do so because there is still a nostalgia about what we were and not perhaps sometimes a reality of what we are. Whatever difficulties lie ahead, the greatest tribute to the ongoing work of the BIS must surely come from those who live the dreams of the society's early pioneers. My name is Scott Carpenter. I am one of the remaining seven Mercury astronauts. The British Interplanetary Society gave us an award some time ago. I am proud of that association because the work we did, which makes any organization which has as part of its title interplanetary, a very special significance. My name's Charlie Duke. I was very fortunate to be uh, involved in a number of the Apollo missions. I was support on Apollo 10 in a uh, mission control on Apollo 11, our first landing, back up on Apollo 13. Flew to the moon as lunar module pilot on Apollo 16 and spent uh, almost 72 hours on the lunar surface exploring the Descartes Highlands of the moon. 
a very exciting uh, adventure for me. When we returned, the British Interplanetary Society gave us a medal for our exploits, uh, which I was very thankful for and very proud and humbled to receive. The British Interplanetary Society and other societies such as that around the world are focused on taking us out to the stars again, and I encourage their work that they're doing, and thanks for all your support during that great adventure of Apollo. I'm Al Worden. I was a command module pilot on Apollo 15, which was the fourth manned lunar landing mission back in uh, July, August of 1971. After the flight, we were honored to be given an award by the British Interplanetary Society. Space societies have to be very strong advocates of space travel to continue to keep the support going for the space programs. And believe me, those of us who've been in space really appreciate it. My name is Jack Lausma, and I flew with some NASA space flights. Uh, I flew on the Skylab space station, uh, the second manned mission, which was about two months. And um, then I was on the backup crew for the flight with the Russians in 1975, ASTP. And then I flew again as the commander of the third test flight of the Space Shuttle Columbia in 1982 with Gordon Fullerton. I was invited to uh, make a presentation at the uh, British Interplanetary Society. And rather than uh, being thrown out, they gave me a medal. And I'm most grateful for that. And uh, I was very interested to uh, understand how back in 1933 uh, anyone had the foresight to uh, think of interplanetary. And now we are touring the planets and we're thinking about going to Mars. And so with great foresight that the forebears of the uh, BIS named it so. I know it's very uh, busy, very active. It's a very influential group. A lot of research has been done. A lot of reports have been written. And I think it is one of the leading uh, societies in the world uh, on this subject. And I'm so pleased to have had the opportunity to be there. I'm Piers Sellers, NASA astronaut. I'm a space walker, and I flew on two missions, both to the International Space Station. The British Interplanetary Society has a long and glorious history. And I think it did a lot to pull together awareness in Britain of the different aspects of spaceflight. When I was a kid, I used to read spaceflight all the time. This organization, other ones like it, you know, they bring the whole picture together so that you people can understand what's going on in the space business and uh, share in the excitement of it. In many ways, the history of the British Interplanetary Society mirrors the history of space exploration itself. From the fantasy of a handful of visionaries across the world to the heady days of the 60s and 70s when men walked upon the surface of the moon and anything seemed possible, to the more pragmatic, realistic, but in many ways much more uncertain future of the 21st century. Whatever the future holds for the British Interplanetary Society, few organisations can have begun with such extraordinary dreams and have seen them go from imagination to reality. We have liftoff.